Hello everybody, this is Laura Susan Johnson with Period Pieces, and today I'm going to talk about a favorite of mine for the past several years, Peacock, starring Killian Murphy, Ellen Page, Susan Sarandon, Josh Lucas, Bill Pullman, and Keith Carradine. This movie was released back in 2010. And it is a 50s period piece. Um, costumes, set design. Uh, yeah, costumes, set design, uh, production design. I guess those are the same things. Makeup. Um, everything is just beautiful. They did a wonderful job. Um, acting is pretty much top-notch. Although P Bill Pullman's character wasn't given a whole lot to do. But he still did a good job with what he was given to do. Um, the story begins with a train derailment. Um, that, that event sets things in motion. Um, this is a suspenseful almost Hitchcockian kind of a drama. It's not a horror film by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the video or the DVD or Blu-ray cover art might lead you to believe it's a horror film, but it's mostly a suspense thriller. Um, it's not a serial killer kind of a thing. In some of the DVD extras, they talk about how they studied uh, the serial killer Ed Gein. But this movie doesn't fit that, that man's story at all. Um, nobody in this movie collects body parts or human skin or weird relics like that. Uh, there is only one instance of, you know premeditated murder in this movie and the motivation behind this one murder is to conceal identity um, to pretty much fake somebody's death. Uh, the main character in this movie, the main characters I should say, are John and Emma Skilpa and it's a double character played by Killian Murphy. Uh, it's really kind of hard to explain without giving away major spoilers. Now, before, if you haven't seen Peacock, don't listen to this review. Watch Peacock first. And I will say, you know, I did already put it in the beginning of the video. Do not, you know, watch, you know, without... Do not watch this video without watching the movie first, because there are major spoilers. Also, the main reveal, the biggest reveal, is done early in the movie, within the first five minutes of the movie. Um, that John and Emma are essentially the same person. Uh, John is the real identity of the person. He is a broken sad, uh, very unhappy, very jumpy, um, unhappy man. He doesn't like people to touch him. He doesn't really like to interact with people. He just kind of goes to work, does his job, goes home, and just kind of likes to be alone. But the day his mother passed away, about a year before the story begins, he did sort of invent his companion, Emma, his second identity, if you will. And this is a female identity. So when he wants to be Emma, he dons a beautiful wig of long, dark hair. He puts on very pretty makeup, like, you know, soft rose lipstick, earth tone eyeshadow. He puts on his base, 
and powder to where his really uneven skin tone turns into this beautiful uh, porcelain smooth and even gorgeous uh, complexion and his personality goes from this agitated uh, jumpy don't touch me personality to this very shy but very sweet and very uh, eager to make friends kind of a personality and as the days begin to pass with that wrecked train in their backyard, John and Emma, I'm speaking as though they are two entities because John clearly, since his mother's death, clearly John has a, he's gone a little bit crazy. He has got two personalities working. Most people, after they've been exposed to Emma, because John couldn't really control the situation. Emma was out getting clothing off the clothesline, which is something she routinely does early in the morning before she sends John off to work. She routinely does laundry. She routinely makes John breakfast, which is usually eggs, bacon, toast, that kind of thing. And then she stops being Emma, and she dresses up as John in these very rumply, ill-fitting suits. I mean, the dresses fit her so much nicer. She looks nice, and she looks well-groomed, and she looks happy when she's Emma. But when, when this personality is John, he just looks like a shrunken man in these gigantic suits. And I'm not sure if he's wearing his father's clothing because he never had clothing beyond boyhood or what. I mean... In the opening credits, you hear his mother abusing him. You don't see anything. You just hear the sounds, and they're very, very disturbing. And you get the sense right away that this woman who's now deceased was a very evil woman. So... This this person, this main character, is, in my opinion, much happier when the Emma personality is in control. But at the same time, the John personality is aware that in spite of this loving, caring demeanor that Emma puts forth, there's a darker side to Emma. And once Emma is exposed to the community and she meets the mayor's wife, Fanny, who is played by Susan Sarandon, th things are starting to become dangerous, in John's opinion. Um, he gets even more alarmed when Emma meets Maggie, who is played by Ellen Page, who does a wonderful job. Everybody does a really great job, but in my opinion, um, Killian Murphy and Ellen Page really carry this movie. The rest are just sort of side characters. Susan Sarandon's kind of the third strength in the movie, but mostly it's um, Killian Murphy and Ellen Page who really carry this movie and make it work. When Emma meets Maggie, for the first time. Maggie is completely fooled because the chameleonic thing, if that's a word, is so well done by Killian Murphy. I mean, you can be fooled by this transformation from John to Emma and back again. Because it's not only the physical stuff, it's not only the makeup, the wig, the dress versus the you know, the short hair, the mud, muddy complexion, the rumpled suits, and the demeanors. 
one demeanor versus another demeanor, one personality versus another personality. It can fool you, and Killian Murphy, they, they gave him brown contacts to wear so that his blue eyes are completely hidden. The blue eyes are his trademark, and they're nowhere to be seen in this movie. So it's one of his strongest performances. Um, at first, when Maggie comes to the house, John is there, and she says, John, um, I'm sorry to bother you. I didn't know where else to go. I haven't gotten any checks in a year. And John's like, what checks? And he's really kind of, you know, abrupt and rude to her at first. She says, your mother was sending me checks, and I haven't gotten any checks from her in a year. Why was she sending you money? John asks. And Maggie says, I thought you knew why. And with her is this little boy about two to three years old. And John looks at this little boy and he says, Oh, no, I didn't know anything about this. And he says, I do have some money. Wait here and I'll go get it. So he goes upstairs and Maggie waits and, he, and she waits and she waits and she waits. Suddenly, down the stairs comes this beautiful woman who Ma Maggie has never met or seen in her life. And this woman asks Maggie, who are you? She says, I'm Maggie. I'm a friend of John's. It turns out this is Emma. And Maggie almost thought that this was John's mother, who John told her was deceased a year ago, and that's why you haven't gotten any money. So... Maggie said, I'm sorry, I'll leave. She goes, please wait. She said, I'm, I'm John's wife, Emma. What, what can I do for you? She says, and Maggie says, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for this to happen. I just, I don't know where to go. I'm trying to move out of Peacock, which is the town. It's Peacock, Nebraska, which is a tiny little town full of gossipy people, and now they all know Emma, except for this Maggie. And she, she explains to Maggie that this child, this little boy that she has in tow, is John's little boy. And she, she talks to Emma for a while, and she becomes more comfortable with Emma, and she finally reveals that John's mother, who molested John and physically and mentally abused John all his childhood, and probably continued to have some kind of mental control over him into his adulthood, turning him into this horribly bruised and battered young man, she picked up Maggie in a bar. Maggie was a fledgling prostitute, basically. She was trying to do honest work, but she knew that she couldn't pay her rent on honest work alone, so she basically had to do things on the side, you know. You know the old saying, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. So... John's disgusting, evil mother picked her up and brought her home to her, obviously, virgin son and forced this young prostitute girl and John to have sex and to do horrible, disgusting things. Uh, Maggie explains that neither John nor herself wanted to do anything like what John's mother forced, and she, John's mother sat there in the room and watched them. Um, Maggie describes John's mother as a perverted, disgusting woman. And uh, it's totally believable. She doesn't go into detail about the gory, horrid, lurid stuff that they do, but it really left a scar on 
all parties involved, while the old perverted woman sat there and watched. And this young little baby boy was conceived during that miserable experience. And this kind this kind of story, you know, it's not for everyone. I mean, this this kind of movie, maybe that's why it wasn't a hit at the box office and probably wasn't marketed very widely. I mean, it was criminally underplayed and underrated, but it's really not the kind of movie that many people can handle because the themes are child abuse, child sexual abuse, perversion, sins against your children, that kind of thing. It's kind of, it reminds me of the book I wrote before I even saw this movie. And Killian Murphy happens to be one of the muses I used when I was writing my first book. I mean, when I write books, I use my favorite actors as my muses. It's kind of hard to write without a face to picture while you're writing. But John... John never does come downstairs because Emma says that he's asleep. And when she says that, you kind of picture her as saying that, meaning the personality is asleep within her, and she's taken over. She's the one who's awake and controlling the, the vessel, pretty much. So it's really a very complex movie. It's a very complicated plot. And it's not a, a simple or stupid thing like, oh, it's just a man in a dress who's crazy and, you know, it's like psycho. He, he loves his mother. He's obsessed with it. He's not obsessed with his mother. He hates his mother, but it's hard to pinpoint that while he's actually, he's got the two personalities and one of them is manifesting as his mother. Because whether or not his mother was an evil pervert, when she died, he became lost. You know, he's lost. Even Emma, she's not outgoing as in running up to people, shaking their hands, how you doing? You know, I'm Emma. She's very gentle and, and demure and shy. She's not, I mean, she's not like John, like, don't touch me, get away from me, and she flinches away from people. But she's not, you know, the life of the party either. After Maggie tells Emma about those horrible details about how little Joey was conceived, or whatever the little boy's name is, I think it's Joey, Emma go, uh, drives her home and talks to her about the mayor's wife, Fanny, um, she talks to her about Fanny's women's shelter and how it can help women who, you know, are financially kind of stranded. Because Maggie, you know, she works at a diner right next door to where she lives in this caravan, kind of a trailer thing. She's $300 behind in her rent or three months behind in her rent, one of the two. And she often sleeps with the diner's manager or owner. And, you know, as the prostitute role, you know, he, he hands her money and she sleeps with him, trying to get some rent, you know, caught up. So, I don't know, it's just, it's really a sad, sad movie, and for a few moments, Maggie resists the idea of going to a women's shelter to, because she thinks those are unambitious women who are just looking for handouts, but Emma says, no, no, you really should try it. It'll help you get back on your feet. They'll help you get a respectable job. They'll teach you job skills that you don't have right now, and it'll probably help you get a better position with better pay. 
And in the meantime, the mayor is wanting John to hold off on getting somebody to remove the train from his backyard because he wants to hold a rally that will help the uh, the upcoming uh, election for the governor or something. That was one part I really didn't understand. But John, uh, when the personality is John, he's all upset. He's, I want that train out of my backyard. I don't want any rallies. I don't want any people swarming around my house. I want things back to where they were, which is I want Emma in the house, away from the public. And I just want life to go on as it was. I just want to go to work, come home, eat my dinner, and go to bed. John is a very private person. He doesn't like a lot of hullabaloo. He likes things quiet and, and very harmless. And he really doesn't like the idea of Emma, Emma out making friends. And it sounds like, you know, when you, th when you think about it, just uh, at a glance, it sounds like John's an asshole who doesn't want his wife out making friends. But... John and Emma are one and the same person. John is threatened by Emma. He has a feeling that Emma's up to no good. Um, everybody assumes that Emma is John's wife, but John pretty much has manifested her as the ghost of his mother, and he believes that his mother is up to absolutely no good, trying to... Well, I would believe trying to get a hold of little Joey because his mother liked to abuse little boys. So I think that's where I'll quit. It's filled with twists. It's filled with surprises. The DVD had an alternate ending, which was really disturbing. Um... I think I prefer the ending that they went with and, you know, left as the real ending. But the alternate ending is interesting, albeit very frightening. Um, it's a very good commentary about pedophilia and about personality disorders and about how children are left ruined by child abuse and how families keep secrets, dark, dark secrets. I, you know, you never did hear about um, John Skilpa's dad. Uh, where was where was the dad during all this horrible brutality that was inflicted upon him? I feel sorry for John. I really do. And at the end, you just wonder what will become... What will become of him? What will become of Emma? What will become of, you know, what will become of this poor soul? Uh, I just don't know. It doesn't matter what happened. Whether, whether uh, you know, if you think about the two endings, the alternate ending and the real ending... Whether, you know, what what happens to Maggie, what happens to little Joey, you know, um, and even if they do get away from Emma, you know, who, who might be the, uh, the resurrection of the mother and her evil ways and her pedophilia, whether or not she got away, whether or not Maggie could get away from that and get out of town and, and keep that little boy safe. Will Emma strike at some other child? So, it's really, um, yeah, it's an interesting movie. It's a very thought-provoking movie. And I think I, I would give it a 10 out of 10. It's just so interesting.